Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The European Advantage, How to Make the Most of CETA. My name is Shelley Fitzgerald, and I'm Editor-in-Chief at Canadian Grocer. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few moments, but while we wait for some people to get logged in and join us, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. First, the materials in this webcast have been reviewed by our editorial team, but the views of the speakers and their organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of Canadian Grocer or its owner, Ensemble IQ. And we'd really like to make this session as interactive as possible, so we do encourage you to use the Q&A function. You'll find it on the left side of your screen below the presenter headshot, so please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. I'll hold on to these questions until near the end and then pose them on your behalf. Your identity will remain confidential to the audience, and if we don't have time to answer all the questions, we'll do our best to follow up with you after the session concludes by email. You can also use this section uh, if you have any technical questions on the webinar itself, and you'll get a direct reply from our webinar producer who's standing by to help. And finally, our recording of the webinar will be available following today's presentation. So on to today's presentation. This afternoon, we're going to share with you some insights on European food and beverage and how to make the most of CETA. Canada's landmark trade agreement with the European Union. So while the selection of food and beverages from Europe and Canadian stores is impressive, uh, this variety is only going to increase in the coming years. And this is reason to attract consumers and businesses' attention to the European Union's More Than Food campaign to highlight these additional opportunities, new European flavors, and high quality standards. Our guest speaker today is Christian Sevier, president of Solimpex and an expert on imports on the EU. Uh, Christian will talk about the competitive advantages of European products from cheese to meats to olive oils and confectionery and of course beer and wine and how they're uniquely positioned to meet the changing preferences and appetites of a more discerning Canadian shopper. Christian will talk about how with CETA in place, there are more opportunities than ever before. And with that, I would like to now hand things over to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Shelley. And um, thank you, Canadian Grocer, for the invitation to, uh, to speak to uh, our great audience this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for being here with us today. Um, I have a few slides to share with you. We will talk about the advantages that the CETA Free Trade Agreement has given to Canadian consumers and retailers uh, because they're making European products much more available than before. So we're going to talk about the advantages that are um, afforded by this trade agreement and how to take, how to capitalize on these advantages, on these opportunities. And then we will have uh, time for questions or Q&A at the end. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, discuss and answer any questions you have. And uh, exchange thoughts on the topic. So if everyone is ready, we will start right away, immediately. And uh, so let's talk about this CETA free trade agreement. Um, you know, it's been in effect in, in already. It's going to be its third year anniversary, uh, in fact, uh, next week or in two weeks from now, September 21st, 2017. It's not... Um, as well known uh, as it should be because we here in Canada are so close to the United States that we do a lot of our, our business with the U.S. It's normal. And so we have a little bit of catching up to do on that. And that's one of the reasons we have these sessions to increase the awareness of this free trade agreement, um, which uh, made all European products uh, more competitive in Canada because of the uh, elimination of tariffs or customs duties, as we call them, on most products. And that was, in effect, immediately on the 21st of September 2017, all our customs duties, tariffs were, reduced, were lowered on most products, on a great majority of products. There's only a very few exceptions to that. So that's the um, first advantage, of course, on the, on the um, um, uh, cost, from the cost point of view. But of course, as you know, cost is is, is important, uh, and sometimes for some products it's the essential element. However, it's not the only factor, and so 
the uh, great um, advantage of this free trade agreement is that it's making a variety of products available to us in Canada or potentially available to us here in Canada from a great variety of countries because the European Union is an entity where, um, of countries that are working together that have the same rules. However, they're very diverse. Um, of course, traditions, uh, cultures, and uh, and uh, um, history is very different in the Baltic states of Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia, for example, as they would be in Mediterranean countries like Portugal or Spain or Malta. Uh, likewise, you have the West European countries of Germany, France, Belgium, Netherlands, where traditions are different from the countries of the eastern side of Europe, Hungary, Romania, uh, and so on and so forth. So as you can imagine, there's such a diversity because of climate, because of traditions, because of habits, because of history, that there's therefore a, a huge variety of products available. And this is what is great for, uh, for us here because we have all kinds of foodstuffs available to us at a um, at lower cost um, because of the reduction in uh, duties and customs tariffs. So uh, that's the the um, elements we wanted to uh, to to uh, share with you um, at first because these are really uh, great assets, great products to to introduce to to the market. Now, looking more at, at uh, slightly more technical issues, we want to draw your attention to. These, uh, these very important element also of European products is that there's long traditions in Europe of these geographic indicators. It's a concept that we don't really use um, very much in Canada. We, in fact, we hardly use it. Um, and whereas on the European side, it's, uh, it's really uh, an old established principle. And what it means is that there's many products uh, on the European continent that are recognized because of their specificity and because they follow uh, certain or specific recipes or traditions. And they also come from very specific regions, areas, very, very where, where there's a limited production of these items. So these geographic indications, as we call them, there's, there's two kinds. There's these, uh, this blue and yellow label and this red and yellow label they give you the assurance that the product that you're that you're selling or that you're purchasing not only is 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 prepared following sets of rules pretty specific sets of rules and traditions uh, but on top of it they come from a very specific area and uh, so that is a double assurance uh, in a way if you want so that uh, as to where it comes from and how it was prepared. And I just want to show you, I just want to share with you, I hope you see them a little bit on the on the camera. Uh, you see, this is the type of thing that you will see on the product, this little circle, yellow and red or yellow and blue. And so why do I want to show them to you is because I want to show you how uh, there are discrete there. So this is not, this geographic indication uh, system is not an advertising uh, a marketing campaign at all. In fact, it's the opposite. It's very small, very hard to see on the package. And it's your indirectly, it's a guarantee that, you know, that this is real, that this is very, uh, very serious business. And so it does take a trained eye to find it. But then once you find it, when you see it on the, on the progress products packaging, then you know it relates to a very specific product, a high quality product following high standards and coming from a designated area within one of these 27 European countries. So these are extremely important uh, elements because I think it, the, 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 the challenge for us is to educate our customers uh, as to, uh, to, to look for them, look for this kind of information, uh, but also understand what it means. So we know consumers nowadays are, are very interested or very um, uh, mindful of uh, contents of products or they're also very interested in uh, nutritional information so let's educate them to also look for signs of origin and so this is uh, these are very good uh, elements to uh, to point out to customers 
Um, so the geographic indicators are indeed a very, very important uh, element of this approach. And so a few hundreds of these geographic indicators have been recognized and have been included in the CETA agreement and, and are recognized as such. Now, if you want, if you were going to ask me about rules, about standards and about quality and, and traceability, this is another interesting uh, element to point out to clients is that even though there's great diversity, we have 27 countries with different, you know, out of these 27 countries, we have 25 languages. So I think if you just think about that, that's enough to, to, um, to realize that there is diversity and, and of, of products. Uh, however, the great aspect, the great asset of the EU is that it, ha it has uniform rules as far as safety of products, as far as uh, traceability of products, safety and security. So receiving, importing a product, distributing and selling a product from the European Union in Canada, it, it indicates that it's a high quality product because it has the EU has these standards in all these countries. It doesn't matter which country, which area, which part of the European Union the product comes from, it follows the same rules. And on top of it, these products, when they arrive in Canada, when we import them into the country, they also have to follow the Canadian rules um, that are administered by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So it's almost in a way like having a double guarantee of uh, quality and, and safety and traceability. Um, so some of you are going to tell me, well, Europe is far, right? This is, uh, it's, uh, it, it seems far, or it, 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 it could look like it's far. But actually, you know what? From a shipping point of view, from a logistics point of view, in fact, it's not further, or it's not much further um, than uh, Central America or, or California or, or Mexico. You know, we do get a lot of products, a lot of food products from this part of the world, from down south. And, you know, Europe is actually more or less at the same distance. And uh, at least for us here in Eastern Canada, uh, those of us who are in Eastern Canada, of course, if you're on the West Coast, it would be a little different. But uh, so that's the first consideration I want to share with you. Real, realize, remember that Europe actually is not very far. And uh, the other thing is that there's also very efficient shipping services linking us with the European continent. Uh, ocean services from North Europe uh, to to Canada to Montreal take about a week of, of crossing time. You know, and so how long does it take for a rail car to come up from Mexico? Um, probably longer. So the um, the time element is not really a deterrent. Uh, and the other consideration also, uh, you might be surprised to hear this, but uh, shipping costs actually are very competitive because ocean freight is very competitive. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of different carriers operating. Uh, so it's a competitive market, a competitive environment. And it doesn't cost more to send a container from Antwerp to Montreal or, or Toronto than to send a trailer from uh, from Mexico or from California or Florida. In fact, in many cases, it will cost less um, simply because of the economics of uh, ocean transportation. It's a very competitive environment, and uh, with intermodal uh, intermodalism, it's. Um, it's very competitive, it's very cost efficient. And so that's something to keep in mind as well uh, in your in your thinking and your strategy and in deciding what kinds of products you want to move forward, you want to start to introduce to your clients. Now, where you might ask me, where do we discover these products? How do we find out about them? Uh, and of course, in pre-pandemic times, it was easy to say, um, let's visit trade shows, uh, go to a trade show in Europe. Um, in fact, sometimes you don't even have to go to Europe. You have a, a trade show in Canada that has been imported from Europe, the Seattle trade show, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's, uh, it's in uh, Montreal every second year and in Toronto every second year, uh, every other year. Uh, the this year's edition was in is in Montreal. Last year I was in Toronto for the Seattle Toronto. So these trade shows are great opportunities to to discover all these products because there's many exhibitors uh, from Europe that attend these trade shows. 
Uh, in Europe itself, you have the Xiao show every year in October, uh, alternating with the Anuga trade show, which is held in Köln, Germany, um, every second year. So, of course, today we can't visit these shows because they are virtual. They're, they've been switched over to virtual platforms for this year, but uh, they will come back in, in, uh, as physical events um, most probably next year. So it's uh, something we wanted to share with you, remind you that, it's a, that visiting trade shows, if they are actual trade shows or virtual trade shows, is a great way to find new products, to find out about and new products that have been developed and, and what certain countries have to offer. So keep that in mind uh, in the future for your quest of, of new products for your clients. And so uh, another question that comes to mind is where, uh, okay, it's, trade shows are a great place to, to discover new products and new suppliers or potential new suppliers. Now, how do we go about uh, getting information uh, on, 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 on suppliers and on what products could be available, available where. So a great source of information for that would be European trade delegates that are based in Canada. And so we have, uh, we have quite a few uh, in Toronto. We have uh, some in Vancouver, in Montreal, and we also have the EU delegation in Ottawa that can, um, provide you this information and also give you the information about the European trade delegates uh, established in your presence in Canada. So these people will be very happy to share information with you on where to source certain products uh, and how to connect with suppliers, potential suppliers in, 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 in European regions. The other body that's um, very useful to know about is the European Chamber of Commerce in Canada. They have a network of European chambers from different, different European countries um, uh, active in Canada. So in Toronto, you have the German Chamber of Commerce, the French Chamber of Commerce, the Belgian Chamber of Commerce, the Italian Chamber of Commerce, and so on. Uh, and so these people would be very happy to also to um, put you in contact with potential suppliers uh, or trade associations in Europe whom you can um, get in contact with and with whom you can communicate to um, find out how to find, uh, where to find these uh, these suppliers uh, that could uh, uh, help you with new products um, for your your stores. And so, and then don't forget, speaking about suppliers, don't forget that uh, a great way to develop the awareness of, of new products is to, uh, and promote them in your store, in your outlets, is to, um, draw from the uh, expertise and the know-how and the traditions of, of those suppliers that we we're talking about. These European suppliers will be very happy to share ideas with you, to share thoughts, to share recipes, to share promotional material or give you ideas on promotional materials that will help increase the awareness of these products and their how attractive they are and how um, healthy they are and how the traceability is really um, uh, guaranteed. Uh, and so don't forget to try to leverage that, to use that tool to increase the awareness in your stores, in your outlets, to, so that your customers see that you're always working hard to look for new products to bring to their um, attention and to bring on their plates. Um, so that's a, a nice... Uh, a feature, a nice advantage, a nice um, item to, to think about when you want to promote your own, your, your, your own outlet uh, and demonstrate to customers that you're always looking to bring them new products uh, that will um, bring their uh, uh, food experience to higher levels. And uh, what I forgot to say in all this presentation um, is that uh, uh, with these new products, particularly the geographic indicators, What's very neat about them is that they relate precisely to certain areas in Europe, to certain towns and villages. And, and, uh, and so what's very nice about them is that in, in these pandemic times where we all would like, or most of us would like to travel, and uh, we know it's not easy to travel right now, and we know it's not um, even recommended uh, and not even possible in some cases. And so 
think of these geographic indicators and about think of these new European products that you're going to bring in as a way for your customers to travel, to discover, uh, and to learn about new places, uh, to learn about the history of certain towns and villages and areas, and to learn about their culinary traditions and, and where they come from, uh, and so on and so forth. So in our pandemic times, in these pandemic times, it's, I think it's even more enjoyable to bring new products like these um, to your your um, stores or to your shelves and ultimately on customers' plates because it enables them to travel and discover and we know Canadians enjoy traveling and discovering other cultures, other countries. And we know right now they are a bit deprived of that because of this pandemic. So don't forget to use that element and put that forward in order to do the, to make the promotion of these uh, new products um, for your customers. And so this actually concludes uh, this part of the webinar of the presentation we have prepared for you. So we hope that you found it interesting, enjoyable, and useful, and we hope it will whet your appetite for European products. And uh, I'm going to give the um, uh, hand over the baton back to Shelley in order to answer questions that you may have uh, during the Q&A. So thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to exchanging with you um, via Shelley. Wonderful. Thank you, Christian. A wealth of information there. So thank you for sharing. Uh, I have a quick few questions for you, just in terms of the cost of these goods. Can you explain a bit more why these are less expensive now than they may have been in the past? Well, it's because uh, the reason for that is that uh, in the past, some of these products were paying customs duties or tariffs, as we call them, uh, particularly right. food preparations. You, there were tariffs of uh, up to 10% or 12% in some cases on some of these products. And so thanks to the free trade agreement, these tariffs have been brought down to zero. So right now, all products coming from Europe come into Canada duty-free, free of tariffs, and they are more competitive than if they were coming from an area where there is no, where we don't have a free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. So that's where, that's the, the, the direct um, impact on cost is the elimination of tariffs of some duties on all products coming from Europe with very few exceptions. Okay. Um, the other thing, a lot of our audience are retailers, of course. So how do they go about accessing European products? What are the steps, I guess? Well, I think so to, to access the, the, the products, I think the first is to, to do a research, of course, on, on what is uh, what is available from where so through the chambers of commerce I mentioned or the European tra trade delegates. And then it's a question for, for retailers, a question of, of uh, do we go through uh, regular channels, i.e. speak to our distributor or the importer who already serves us? Um, which is the, and, and get them to import, to bring in these new products. Um, uh, or do we try to, um, do we want to perhaps go direct to suppliers and do a little bit of uh, importing ourselves? I mean, the two, um, it's possible to, to do it either way. I think going through existing channels, of course, is easier. Uh, and, uh, uh, and um, faster and, and less risky. Uh, there are people in, in the retail industry who sometimes uh, use that as an incentive to develop their own, to do their own purchasing, sort of their own search of products, and, and then become importers. Um, so that's also possible to, to uh, bite the bullet and, and import these products directly yourself. However, that is not something that one can improvise. It requires... Uh, a little bit of experience, knowledge, and you have to be, I think the, the, if you wanted to go that way, it's good to have uh, partners who can help you or, you know, uh, support um, because it's um, it's uh, it's a tricky area. We, you have to know the rules. So I would say either way, it goes through regular channels or create your own channel uh, and go directly to uh, suppliers, potential suppliers, which is more demanding and requires more knowledge and will take more time also. Okay, great. Uh, so we have time to take a few questions from the audience. As I said at the top, please 
Submit Great. your questions using the Q&A feature on the left side of your screen. Uh, so here we have one for you, Christian. Uh, it says you focused on generic opportunities to import. Since the agreement has been in place since 2017, where have Canadian exporters taken advantage of the agreement? And where do you see the most significant F&B export opportunities? Well, so yes, so, the agreement has been in effect 2017, but uh, it is, it is unfortunately, is still underutilized. And in fact, there was a survey done by Global Affairs, uh, which came out in June, which highlighted the fact that uh, according to their data and their research, um, only about 50% of Canadian companies that do business with Europe take advantage of the tariff reduction. So I personally was very surprised to see that. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a fact. And so it shows us, and it shows in this case, it shows our government that they need to do more promotion of the agreement itself and its advantages. Um, not all Canadian companies are aware of these free trade agreements or of this one in particular and of the advantages that it takes. And I think sometimes, you know, it's in a way, it's not, nothing is always black and white. You know, we also see if we dig into it further, we also see that sometimes companies are a bit afraid um, to go into new markets or new areas and they find that uh, maybe some regulations are, um, intimidating and uh, so there's there's two sides to the story it's uh, you also have in order to to do more business in europe uh, either if you're an exporter and you want to export your products to europe or the other way around bring european european products in there's a learning curve uh, going international is not something that one can improvise so there's great potential to summarize. I'm sorry it was a long answer to a short question, but okay. <laughs> I think the figures show us, the statistics show us that there's that we can improve. We can still do a lot more. Uh, we are we we're not utilizing the free trade agreement to its fullest potential. Okay. Uh, another audience question here: Approximately how long does it take to receive products from Europe, and has the COVID-19 pandemic had an impact on importing these products from the timing? Uh, so from a timing and logistics point of view, uh, yes, of course, there's been an impact. Um, I think the impact has been more uh, severe for uh, perishables that are transported by air because since uh, uh, the pandemic, since mid-March, um, we know there's few, much fewer flights. And, you know, about half of cargo that's transported by air worldwide is actually shipped on passenger flights together with the baggages together with the baggage, you know. And so um, half of it transported on passenger flights means that, uh, and because we, since we only have something like 5% of, of our usual passenger flights, it meant that people had to scramble to find cargo planes to ship these products by air on, on cargo aircrafts. And so there was, uh, there was a huge increase in demand for cargo aircrafts for that reason. Of course, it was mainly because of personal protection equipment that we wanted to ship at the time. So for air transportation, the impact has been severe in a sense that it's been more difficult to find space and to ship goods by air. It's also been more expensive. Uh, rates have shot up really. And so it has been an issue uh, for air transportation. Rates increased about threefold, you know, three times. Uh, and uh, they went back down. They started to go back down in June. So they're not quite at their normal level yet, but pretty close to now. For ocean transportation, I think it was relatively smooth. Um, services were not really affected very badly. There was a reduction in volume carried, but ocean, kind of, ocean carriers maintained services pretty well uninterrupted. There were some issues in some regions, for example, in Italy, there were difficulties at the ports at the very beginning of the pandemic. But I think by and large for ocean transportation, things worked more or less as usual. Uh, don't forget that uh, logistics, transportation is uh, are considered essential activities. So all these companies were in fact able to work more or less normally uh, with, with different circumstances, but still um, so I think it was not, um, it was more difficult for air transportation than for ocean transportation, um, but it, it worked reasonably well, I would say. Okay. 
Um, another audience question here. Uh, you spoke of um, travel limitations at the end of your presentation. Uh, since the question is, since we cannot travel currently, is it commonplace for suppliers to provide samples prior to the purchasing of large quantities? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, anything that's sent by air, so samples would be sent by air, could be it could take a little longer than usual and could cost a little more because of the restrictions on travel, because of the fact that there's just less flights available, even though they're coming back gradually, but they're still far less than usual. Uh, so yes, it would be common to get samples sent by air, and, and it, it, it can still be done on a regular basis. Um, it could be a bit tricky if there are perishables, but uh, yes, it's possible to do it, absolutely. Okay, great. Maybe one more short question here. How are geographical indicators or designations regulated in general? Well, there are very strict rules and, and regulations, and so you can't just, uh, you, you have to apply for it, and then you have to demonstrate that uh, that you follow the rules on ingredients, on processes, and that you only process ingredients from the region, and or that you only process the, the product in that region, and that's that's highly regulated, it's, it's controlled, uh, and uh, it's a very um, elaborate system that, that has been in effect for years. Uh, you see all these, uh, many of these European countries have been producing food and, uh, and there's a lot of diversity in all these regions. So, so each, each, each of these countries actually had their own system already. Right? And so now it's, a, it's, it's an EU wide system of, of controls, uh, of quality controls and they're very, very strict and very, um, very much controlled, and so uh, uh, you have to. Uh, it, it is a guarantee uh, of that your supplier follows certain processes and that your product comes from a specific region. Absolutely. Ooh, wonderful. Uh, well, that's our time uh, again, Christian. I'd like to extend a big thank you for joining us today and sharing all of those insights and information. And thanks thank to all much. of. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for taking the time to listen. But before you go, uh, please take a few minutes to complete a short survey. Uh, those who complete it will have a chance to win one of five curated gift baskets containing a selection of EU products worth approximately $250. Um, so please take a few moments to complete that if you could. And uh, again, that thank you for listening. That opens our appetite. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you for listening. Um, have a great day, everyone. And good luck, everyone.